Good morning uh, and welcome. I'm Robert Summercrest, uh, the new dean of the Terry College of Business. I know a few of you are still working on uh, grabbing a cup of coffee or a little bit uh, to eat here uh, while we get uh, seated. But uh, just to keep us on schedule, I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's, is a microphone on? Can you hear me? OK, great. Well, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm honored to have been named the 11th uh, dean of the Terry College of Business at the University of Georgia. And while I'm new at the college, as many of you know, it certainly is not a new college. We're in our 95th year, which makes us the oldest business school in the Southeast. I started at the Terry College on July 2nd, so if you look at work days, that's 14 days ago. I am <laughs> really new. Um, I've been able to make some introductions uh, with some of our alumni and supporters here in Atlanta. Uh, as you might imagine, I've had a lot of meetings in Athens uh, trying to meet people and, and get a sense of where the college is and where uh, our constituents think we should be going to combine that with our environment and really uh, generate a vision for the future. I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you today and look, look forward to having uh, many more of these Terry Third Thursdays. Now, I, I've talked to a few of you, uh, not as many as I had wanted, but I've talked to a few of you and I know that for some people this is the first time you're at a Terry Third Thursday or any event in our Executive Education Center. Uh, so a special welcome to you. Uh, and welcome to this center, which is a real key for us here at the Terry College. Uh, the facility is about two years old, and this center, this facility in Atlanta, is one of the things that really impressed me about the Terry College and one of the things that really made me want to come to the University of Georgia to be its, uh, its dean. I think we're heading in the right direction. I think it gives, us, uh, gives the college a true home in Atlanta, which is a prime location for us connecting to Georgia's business community. And I'm confident that while we're using it today, we're going to make increasing use of this center over the coming years. Uh, as probably all of you know, this is the home of our Executive Education Center, and that was kind of the, uh, the original justification for it going back to 2005. But we've been uh, expanding it. Um, the college offers an evening MBA program, kind of a, a, a one day a week per class uh, program in Gwinnett. And we're going to be expanding that program to uh, take advantage of our facilities here in Atlanta at the Executive Education Center. The applications for our fall program have been strong, and I'm expecting us to start with a full cohort when classes are uh, in schedule this fall. Um, they'll be breaking in a new classroom, and, and by the way, we have uh, a new classroom, which is uh, right next door to a reading room. And if you haven't had a chance to, to take a look at the center uh, and you've got some time after we finish, you're certainly welcome to take a look around and, and see all our facilities. It is a, a very nice space that we've got here. Um, the MBA programs, as I said, are really the core of what we've been doing here at the Executive Education Center, but that certainly is not all that we provide. We have a certified financial planners program. It's a certificate program. We have uh, each year a director's college, which uh, is a short course for uh, corporate board um, instruction. We've got a CFO roundtable that we've been starting recently and an advanced school of marketing research, which we are uh, co-sponsoring with the American Marketing Association, or AMA. And lots of other things are going on here. So this is truly a, a key for us in Atlanta and I think a very important part of the University of Georgia. Um, a lot of the credit for this goes to my predecessor, George Benson. Uh, George, along with the uh, university administration, took a risk in coming here. It's an expensive facility to run. There were some uh, questions about whether or not we could actually pull this off because it's a crowded marketplace here for higher education in Atlanta. And yet it, it has been a tremendous success and I think an increasing uh, success story for us. Um, before going any further, I want to recognize some of our sponsors. Uh, Terry Third Thursday certainly would not be possible without the generous support that we receive. Our premier corporate sponsor has three representatives with us today, uh, and I'd like them to stand. We have uh, Elizabeth Livengood, uh, Alik uh, Hillier, and Kelly Green. Hope I got those names right or close. Thank you very much. Our, our corporate sponsor is Deloitte, and I believe we have one representative from Deloitte. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of media sponsors here from uh, Public Broadcasting of Atlanta. 
we have Harriet Hoskins Abrahal. Uh, Harriet, would you stand? And I believe we have two representatives from the uh, Atlanta Business Chronicle, Shelley Lewis and Cheryl McDonald. Um, thank you very much. So again, it's, it's really critical to us to have these uh, generous sponsors for Terry Third Thursday. And now before I uh, pass the podium over, I want to uh, mention just briefly some of the upcoming programs. Uh, in August, we have another accomplished uh, alumna of the college who is an entrepreneur. Uh, our speaker will be Maxine Clark, and Maxine is the chair, uh, chief executive, and founder of Build-A-Bear Workshops. Now, if you're not familiar with Build-A-Bear, I think probably many of you are. Uh, it's been around for 10 years, and Maxine has built it into a 300-store retail enterprise. She's also published a book recently called The Bear Necessities, Building a Company with Heart, and I hope you're going to be able to join us uh, next month. That'll be on August 16th. Uh, following that, in September, we're going to have Georgia's basketball coach, uh, coach Dennis Felton. Um, he's been the dog coach since 2003, and obviously he'll be talking about uh, Georgia basketball, but I think he's going to talk more generally about some of the challenges that are facing us in sports and specifically in basketball today. Uh, and then uh, in October, um, I've uh, been asked to be the Terry Thirty Thursday speaker, and I'm, I'm anxious to do that. And by then, I'll be able to share a little bit more of my vision for the Terry College, uh, perhaps have some time to take questions, and um, talk not just about vision, but I think something that's uh, very important, and that's implementation of that vision. We need to really be able to accomplish the things that we set out for us. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to our uh, uh, alumnus Richard Quartz. Richard is going to introduce our speaker and Richard is uh, not just a graduate of the Terry College, he's also Vice President of Carter here in Atlanta. Richard is a member of our alumni board and has been serving in that capacity since 2002. Richard's currently chair of the task force in charge of Terry Third Thursday and thus his role with us today. Richard, would you please uh, introduce our speaker. Well, uh, thank you, Dean uh, Sumacras, and I will just tell you, I had lunch with uh, the Dean last week, and I'm very excited about his vision for propelling the university uh, business school, or the Terry College, into uh, and growing it and, and taking advantage of the great platform we have in place. So uh, we're very excited to have you on board and look forward to hearing more about that um, when you're uh, on the hot seat uh, here at Terry Third Thursday. And, uh, I think it's August, September, what are we? October. So anyway, uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker, Susan McWhorter Driscoll. Um, Susan earned two degrees from the university, uh, one from Terry. Um, she got her bachelor's degree uh, in 1985 and a master's degree uh, in marketing and research a year later. Uh, after that, she gradu after graduation, she went to work for Coca-Cola here in Atlanta. She spent 10 years at Coca-Cola where she led the commercialization team uh, for the new 20-ounce plastic Coca-Cola contour bottle. Um, she also was uh, very uh, involved in, in directing the marketing for the Coca-Cola sponsorship of the, the uh, Olympic torch relay that started here in Atlanta in 1996 when we hosted the Olympics. Um, her success in the torch relay led her to uh, uh, several other uh, grassroots marketing projects at, at Coca-Cola, but uh, ultimately led her to found uh, the firm uh, McWhorter Driscoll in 1997 with her partner and husband. Um, uh, McWhorter Driscoll is now known as Ignition, and their marketing business includes overseas operations and a creative studio here in Atlanta. Uh, Susan is uh, responsible for all the financial planning and management of the company here um, and uh, the type of marketing ideas that McWhorter Driscoll uh, or Ignition now generates uh, come in a lot of varieties but it's basically event marketing, consumer promotions, product demonstrations to name just a few and Susan calls it the power of the human touch. That doesn't really mean a whole lot to me, but that's a great thing that Susan's here to explain it to us. Um, so Susan, if you will come on up and, and uh, 
uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. And also, I just want to remember, remind everybody that when you uh, do ask questions uh, in our Q&A session, if you could make sure you get a microphone so we can get that uh, on our webcast, that would be super. Good morning. Is the micro microphone going? Great. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, it's my first time, um, uh, something this early in the morning for a while. Um, the 1996 Olympic torch relay was a starting point for a lot of things for myself and my future. Um, but the one thing it was a starting point for was to no longer be a morning person. Prior to that, I would get up about 5.30 in the morning. I lived in Marietta and I'd beat the, the traffic down to the Coca-Cola building and meet all of my running buddies and we go run several miles and then go to HealthWorks and get all refreshed and have a really productive day. But when I went and traveled for 84 days on the Olympic torch relay and my friend Bill Slubin was there traveling with us, um, we weren't getting a whole lot of sleep. In fact, I was the spokesperson for Coca-Cola. So what that meant was I was at the um, TV studio at probably around 6 a.m. Um, every morning and you know it's funny how they say you got to be here at 6 because we never know when we're going to put you on but it was always like 8, 8.30 before you got on the air but you're there at 6 a.m. ready to go. Now that would be okay on most days but as you'd travel through the day at noon we'd have to go to the next city and be on the the noon news and then you'd have to jump on up to the next city and be on the 11 o'clock news and your day went over because you had to hop ahead to wherever you're going to be to be on the 6 a.m. news the next morning. So I was averaging about four hours of sleep during that journey. Um, so once we got done, I think I slept for several days. And ever since then, morning is not my time. So bear with me on this as we go forward. Um, what I'd like to do is start off by sharing with you a quote that's kind of the, the platform of what Ignition and our igniters, as we call them, stand for around the world and how we bring to life this thing we call the human touch. This was um, sent to my husband and I by a friend of ours several years ago and he and his wife had just found out some news that she had brain cancer and so a way to communicate to all of us as their friends, they sent us this quote to say this is how we're going to take on this challenge that life has given us. And it really can apply too to a lot of things and like right now today, we have people in Mongolia. They just got through Belarus, um, Russia, and Mongolia. We've got people in China. So a lot of the young people that work for us are these intrepid spirits as well. And it goes like this. The sea is dangerous and it's storm terrible. But these obstacles have never been sufficient reason to remain ashore. Unlike timid souls, intrepid spirits seek victory over those things that seem impossible. It is with an iron will that they embark on the most daring of all endeavors to meet the shadowy future without fear and conquer the unknown. And that's been accredited to an explorer in the 1500s named Magellan. But we really try to live that every day and we just got through um, last week hosting the LEAD program that um, University of Georgia is very involved in. We had about 40 high school senior, up and coming high school seniors that are spending three weeks at Georgia learning about different facets of um, maybe thinking about what they want to do when they grow up. And so to share things like with these young kids is to give them a way to take on that shadowy future and think about things. So our young people around the world are definitely the sh taking on the, the challenges. Let me see if we can work this. Okay, well, as we get into the human touch, um, I think first it, it may help to understand a little bit about ignition and what we stand for and how we've approached business. Um, when we first started about 10 years ago, my husband and I were like, you know what, we've got to do something different. I, ca I came from Coca-Cola for 10 years and he had, our, he had been an entrepreneur for the past 20 years, pretty much in this space. Um, he's probably one of the pioneers that just started bringing advertising to life. He started off with Anheuser-Busch, and they had the ad at the time, and believe it or not, they still have it today, I think, which is unusual that a campaign lasts for 30 years. But um, head for the mountains, head for Bush beer. So he's like, okay, what can we do? How can I bring this to life? And he was a ski racer in his day, and he wasn't ready to give that up yet. So he went and convinced Anheuser-Busch that they needed to literally bring the mountains to the people so they could head to the mountains and enjoy some Bush beer in the moment. So they went and literally built ski hills in places such as Miami, 
Boston Common. So it didn't have to be cold weather, it could be hot weather. And then he got some of his buddies, like Billy Kidd at the time, and they gave demonstrations and taught people how to ski and gave away lots of beer, because that was before there was a whole lot of rules about doing that stuff. So, so he had been doing that for quite a while and really learning and pioneering on how to do it in the future. So he had started several companies and he had sold them to McCann Erickson. So when he and I decided to start our company, we said, you know what, let's make the foundation more than just about the bottom line. Now, we need to have a positive bottom line or we can't do a lot of great things for people. But let's try to do it in a way that we really do make a positive difference in people's lives. And that really fits in as well to what we call experiential marketing or the human touch because a lot of our marketing tools are all about making friends for the brands, for our customers, um, for our brands, the, our, our clients, customers. Spit it out, Susan. So we really wanted to make a difference in people's lives, in our employees' lives, in our clients' lives, and in their customers' lives. So to do that, we really have to do it by empowering people to dream and to open their hearts and to think different. And so we really encourage the thousands of igniters that work for us all around the world to really look at life in a different way, in a very positive way, and think beyond of, I'm just sampling a Coca-Cola for the day, but I'm really having a chance to make a difference in someone's life. I know one of the things that touched me the most and helped me understand I wanted to be in this business is when we were on the 1996 Olympic torch relay, and we're in some small town in Iowa. And we were um, waiting for the Olympic flame to run by, and we had all the fun kids running around handing out ice-cold Coca-Colas, sharing the Olympics with America. And this one lady came up to me, and I gave her an Olympic Coca-Cola pen, and she started crying. And she said, that's the nicest thing someone's done for me in a long time. And I went, oh, wow. And it was Coca-Cola that did it for her. And so you, we built real long-lasting relationships with these people as we traveled across the country. So we create memorable human experiences. That's what we're all about in our business. And we do it by operating with a thing called poise and passion. Poise, it's an attitude of confidence which comes from complete honesty. A belief in what you're doing is good for you and your customer. Complete trust in the mission. So when we work with our young people, first and foremost, well, you got to be honest with us. you got to tell us the truth. Now, in our business, you see a lot of experiential marketing. You see a lot of big trucks with big graphics on it, and they travel all around the world and all that stuff. So we have a lot of vehicles in our lives. So one of the examples is, kids, if you wreck it, Tell us now. Don't let us find out later when the insurance guy is calling us up. So be honest. We may get upset a little bit, but we're going to get really upset if you don't tell us the truth. And you've got to believe in what you're doing. Um, an example of this is right now we literally have a team of people running around the world. And they're running around the world to raise awareness for safe drinking water. And Dow is, one of our, is, is our primary sponsor. So when we recruited these 20 runners that were going to do this feed, we had to make sure that they believed in what they were doing. And they believed that Dow is really a company that is trying to do good things to make a positive difference in the world. Because Dow could be one of those where people go, oh, they're a chemical company, they're doing all these bad things. So we had to make sure that all 20 of these runners really, really believed and represented what they were going to do. And they got a trust in the mission. There's another saying we have, which is passion. And it's P for poise. A, attitude, and, you'll, and around in our company we have a lot of these things. My husband's the king of these things, but it helps. It sinks in and people remember them. We have P to the fifth, proper planning prevents poor performance. C to the fourth, don't condemn, complain, criticize, or cuss, which my husband has a really hard time on. He grew up in a locker room. D to the third, dedication, determination, and desire. You get all of those things working together, and you're going to get a winner. And so we try to strive for those every day. Now, there's the 80-20 rule. 80% of the time, things are going to be great. 20% of the time, they're going to be really, really bad. But you've got to just keep on moving forward. S, we have to have substance over style. Now, you've got to have style. You know, you've got to relate to consumers and be in the look they want. But you've got to have stuff underneath it. You've got to have the substance. You've got to be sincere. Strategic. Most of the time, you know, our clients already come with their strategy of what they're trying to do, but you have to approach it in a very strategic way to make sure you're developing the programs the best way. 
innovative. Now, when my husband started in this business about 30 years ago, it was pretty simple. Pit a ski hill, you know, and people were going, wow, I've never seen that before. Or um, JMB on the rocks, and he put a, one of the first traveling rock walls, and people would climb and, you know, think that was really cool. Well, now in today's world, it's getting harder and harder to break through and do something that really is unique and meaningful. So you've got to be very careful that you're innovative, but you're innovative in a very relevant way that the consumer is going to relate to it. The one that our clients love, oh, on time, on budget. You can like, you know, sometimes make it get on time, but throw a pile of money at it. Well, people aren't going to be happy with that. And a lot of the things we do, there's a very finite time, like the Olympic torch relay. You better have that Olympic flame there ready for opening ceremonies or you're going to have some trouble. So on time, on budget. And then in, in the last letter in passion, is nonstop forward motion. As I mentioned before, that 80-20 rule. So you got to keep pushing, pushing forward because every now and then you're going to be knocked backwards and you got to just keep going forward. So let's talk about the power of the human touch. We believe that it's something that can't ma be measured in pix pixels. Now, we believe that this is an integral part of the marketing mix. We're not saying that you should use experimental marketing or the human touch in replacement of television, in replacement of the internet marketing. No, it's another piece of the puzzle. If you put it together correctly, it can be very powerful. And at the very end, I'm going to show you a very short video of an event that did that very successfully. Now, to look at it, let's think back through history of how, how can, um, people were communicated to, especially as um, businesses started to communicate to people on a broad scale about their products. In the 1920s, there was this thing, this screen, we call it the five screens that people can be communicated to. In the 1920s, there was a screen called, what happened in the 20s? Television. Movies, movies first. We had the movie theaters. Then in the 50s, we had television. Then the 70s came, if you were really hip and cool, the computers. And then in the 90s, we got the telephone and PDAs, but there's this other screen that we really focus on called the human touch. And there's a lot of people today that say they invented it, that it's something new, it's this new piece of the marketing mix, and we go, no, 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 no. Think about this guy, Moses. He went up on this mountain and saw God, and he got this tablet, this stone tablet with some um, commandments on it, and he came down from the mountain and they tell me that the Bible is in street language. You know, it kind of sounds strange to us sometimes, but they say it was street language of the day. And so just imagine him coming down and saying, hey, dude, I just saw God. And I've got these ten commandments, and if we live life this way, things are going to be awesome. And from that built a whole group of disciples, and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and continued. So we believe the human touch, or the fifth screen as we talk about it, has been around for a long time before a lot of the other ways to talk to people. And we think as we get technology more involved in our lives, which is great, we still have to keep that human touch and that human connection for our brands to help really put some dimension to it and some relationships to grow. Now, unfortunately, um, the human touch can be used in a negative way. The guy in um, Germany with a mustache Hitler, you know, got a huge army to do bad things. So we want to make sure that let's use the human touch to do things that are very positive. The one thing, too, that the human touch does is it accelerates the adoption cycle. You know, as you talk about a brand, sometimes to go from discovery to trial to reconsideration to adoption to retrial can take months or a year. But if you're doing experiential marketing or the human touch, you can speed that up to a very short time period. I can be at um, outside of a Walmart parking lot. It's a hot day, and um, Coca-Cola has just introduced this great new product called Tab Energy. And it's going to give you that lift and encouragement. So as the, the young women are walking out of the store, I have this great oasis set up with a pink everywhere. And I've got these wonderful, friendly young girls. And I go up to you and say, hey, try this new tab energy. It's going to give you some energy, and it tastes great. Well, right then, we've gone from awareness to, to um, trial to hopefully acceptance of the product, and hopefully they become an evangelist or a broadcast tower. So you can really speed up the adoption cycle and getting people introduced to a brand. And one thing we do as we work through it is we say, let's try to make sure 
that we follow some type of process, that, that strategic piece of it. So we try to look at how do we use the five senses, how do we use sight, smell, touch, taste, and hearing to really bring the brand experience to life. And some brands can apply to all of these, and some apply to just some of them, but you just kind of work through those senses to try to get the whole experience for the people. And then what we do is we try to follow the five E's. We engage the consumer. You've got to surprise and delight them. You've got to do something that's unique and different, but you've got to do it where it's relevant. Um, in Cleveland the other day, Right Guard was trying to engage some consumers. They put these strange um, stickers on the streets, and people called in the FBI because they didn't know what it was. So, so you've got to be careful that you're doing it in a way that's relevant and not too over the top. And then in Boston a while back, I know you guys all heard with Turner where they thought they were trying to bomb down the, the um, bridges and stuff. So, so you got to engage, but do it in a way that doesn't really freak people out or it's something they can enjoy and be positive. And then you educate them about the brand. You've got to make sure that when you're out there talking to them that you have key messages that are very succinct that's telling them why they may want to be involved with this product and understand it. Entertain, make it fun. People need to smile. People want to laugh. And most products are not so serious that there can't be something fun and happy about it. So enter entertain them as you go about it. Give them the whole immersion, the experience using the five senses, and then turn them into evangelists or broadcast towers. Now, a lot of people say, okay, well, this will work with, you know, a brand like a Coca-Cola where it only costs 50 cents. And, you know, you can get out there and you can get people to make up their mind. But we have found out, and we've always believed, that it can work with products that maybe cost a few million dollars. You go, yeah, right. Well, Embraer is a, um, a private jet. They actually make regional jets, but they decided to get into the private jet business a couple of years ago. And they have the Phenom 100 and the Phenom 300. And the Phenom 100 seats four people, pilot, co-pilot, and the 300 is six people in the back, pilot, co-pilot. Um, the 100 cost about $3 million, and the 300 cost about $6 million. Now, talking about fundraising, Dr. Reddy has a, a bet with my husband that one day his dream is to buy a jet. But when he does buy that jet, he has to give Dr. Reddy and the Masters of Marketing Research Program a big donation. So, so we have to get enough not only for the jet, but afford the donation as well. But what we did is we talked to them, and they said, you know, we're, we're going to introduce these jets to, um, to the consumers. And um, how can we do it besides the normal way that people sell jets of going to some air shows, heading out brochures, um, being in the upscale magazines? Um, what can we do to really make this difference? So we said, well, let's take the fuselage, because this plane is unique in that they had BMW to design the interior and the cockpit. It's a beautiful plane. And so let's take the fuselage where the people are that potentially could afford to buy one of these planes. So let's go to the Lake Placid Horse Show. Let's go to, we're right now in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, at one of the largest air shows in the world. So let's go to these equestrian programs. Let's go to the polo matches. So let's take this fuselage to them, set it up in a very inviting environment so they can come and take a break and, you know, they can sit down and look at the plane. And we have our igniters there along with some of their salespeople, but it's very low key and, and relaxed. And we even went to um, the driver's parking area at some NASCAR events because they all buy jets. So let's go where they are and let's let them experience the jet without having to, and these things weren't ready for sale yet. You know, it's going to, your first delivery is going to be two years from now before you can get your first jet. So we said, let's go try it and see. Now, I'm shooting myself that we didn't do a commission basis deal on this one um, because I said, no, we'll do our normal fee and see what happens. But we have helped them sell about 250 jets now. And at one event we were at, this gentleman, he wasn't even on their radar because a lot of times they'll invite the people, you know, they'll be on their mailing list and say, hey, if you're coming to this event, come visit us and all this great stuff. This guy wasn't even on their radar. He walked up, he looked at them both, and he says, okay, I'll take one of each. And so you never know. So, so the power of the human touch can work for things as much as 50 cents or for something as several million dollars. And then also they can work for um, um, foundations. It can work for services. It can work. One thing ESPN the magazine does 
is it uses experiential marketing as a way to help add value to its advertisers. So the advertisers buy the normal ad pages, and then they do an add-on where they take the grid iron blowout, which I'll tell about a little bit more, and use that as an added value to help get their advertisers out to their customers at different locations. So what I'm going to do, because a lot of times when people say, what do you do, it's easier just to give some examples. And the, the range of experiential marketing can go from very, very simple to something like this that we did for Brand Atlanta to some very, very elaborate programs. And Brand Atlanta was all about talking to the people of Atlanta, Metro Atlanta, and saying, hey, every day is opening day. And if you just come downtown one time, a year, more than you do already, the economic impact on the city is phenomenal. And you know what? There's some really great diamonds in the rough here that people just don't think about. We've got great restaurants. We've got great plays. We've got great sports. We've got a great park. I mean, we have all kinds of really great stuff in the city that we need to take advantage of. So how are we going to get that message out? And so what we did is put an army of people out throughout Atlanta, different areas, and just talked one-on-one -on -one to all the people that they ran into. And we talked to about a million people throughout the three months that we um, did this program. And doing this, and as we do any program, there's certain things you need to think about as you put the program together. You've got to make sure that the people fit the brand. Um, the person that you would have talking to people that lived out in the suburbs may be very different in that the people that are talking in Midtown. Because if you're talking to some people maybe in the suburbs, you're going to tell them about the great things that the Children's Museum and the things that will engage them. Well, in Midtown, you're going to go, hey, we got some great clubs and things like that. And they're a different demographic and age group. So you got to make sure that you're having the right people connect with the right people. And that will depend on the brand. You got to make sure you have great messaging. You can't make it too complicated. We're always telling people, be as simple as you can. One of the best ones was when we did the Olympic torch relay in 96. Coca-Cola sharing the Olympics with America. Very concise, that is it. Um, what are you doing out here? We're spreading fun and refreshment. So make it a very concise statement and make sure that you just drill it into the promoter's heads that that's the messaging that they're giving. And training. One thing about experiential marketing is every day is Super Bowl. Because you only have one chance to talk to these people, and as each day goes by, that chance is lost. So we make sure every day we have the morning huddle. And the teams get together, and they look at each other in the eye, and they make sure that they are ready for the day. And especially if you're doing a tour that travels along the road, they can get really tired and fatigued. So sometimes you may need to give a people a day off if they're just not really connected and into it. So you make sure they're ready, make sure they understand the messaging, and make sure they're ready to go. And after you do something for 40 days, sometimes you tend to get lazy. So you got to remember, this is our day. This is the only time these people are going to see us. So we got to be like, we're ready for the Super Bowl. We got to make sure we create the memory point. And we got to take it to the people. Go where they live, work, and play. So like where we took the Embraer, we took it to the driver's parking lot at NASCAR events, because that's where they live, work, and play. They don't do a whole lot else but travel. So take it to where they are. And when you're doing programs, we always have to make sure we're focused on what we're doing, but we've got to have flexibility. Nothing's ever going to be perfect when you're, this is live advertising. So there's no retake. There's no, let's go again. <laughs> So you got to be flexible, figure it out, and work through it. And then you got to finish, so you got to finish strong. you got to make sure you track it. A lot of people say, how do you measure return on investment for this type of marketing? And it really varies by brand. You know, some brands may be um, all about getting the word out there as fast as they can. Others may be on collecting um, email addresses. Others may be on immediate sales. But you got to make sure you track it every day and follow through. Now, I'm going to go to a little bit bigger. I was telling you about the ESPN blowout. And so this is more of a mobile tour. And what they've done is they've built the bases, and it goes to college football games. And so I really like this the last two years because I got to go to the Georgia-Florida game as a business expense, which is nice. Unfortunately, next year, this year, we're not going to be there because our friends at the Gator Bowl doubled our site fees, so blew our budget. So we won't be, we won't be at the Georgia-Florida game this year. But they go to the top games each week. And they're all about having some fun and bringing the ESPN brand to life for the college kids. 
Then they offer sponsorship opportunities for a number of their advertisers like Campbell and Nissan, Gillette, LG, and they can then build around that with experiences for their brands with that audience. Another thing is you get even bigger but this is really more about bringing a unique experience. I know here in the U.S., if you're doing NASCAR, you see you can go buy a used NASCAR. You know, it's no big to go sit in one of those. Well, with F1, until we started this program about three or four years ago, you as a normal person did not get to touch a Formula One car. And if you did get to see one out in the public, you had these big bodyguards standing around daring you to take a picture, touch it, look at it hardly or anything because they have all these secrets they claim that they don't want their competition to know about their car. So Vodafone was the sponsor of Ferrari and Vodafone wanted to make sure that they're getting a, you know the hundred million plus that they were paying to sponsor this thing. They wanted to make sure they were going to try to get some value out of it and getting value means selling more Vodafone service. So what we did is we said let's do something that no one has ever done in the Formula One world and let's actually let people sit in an F1 car. And they were like, no way, Ferrari will never let you do that. But my husband, in his convincing way, we went to the Ferrari factory, which by the way is one of the most phenomenal places you can ever visit, and convinced them that this was something cool to do. So they gave us actually four um, old um, Ferrari cars. And I think they actually thought, okay, if we give them old ones, maybe our competition will think they're our current ones. And, take something from it they shouldn't take. And we only paid $250,000 per car with no engine, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, they are Ferraris. Um, but we, we took those cars, we put a, built them on this um, stage that was all hydraulic so it can roll down the road. And one thing you get with these marketing programs also is moving billboards because you're traveling all over Europe in this circumstance. And then we got with EA Sports and we put um, the games into them. And so people could actually sit in a Ferrari F1 car and pretend they were driving. And then what they did is taking the, the extending it even further, did a worldwide online game competition. And then the winners from every country, so there's about 20 countries that participated, flew in to Monza, which was the big F1 um, Ferrari race, and had the world championship, and Michael Schumacher was there to award the winner with the prize. So you can take the human touch and spread it even bigger by connecting it with the internet as a marketing tool. So, oh, and the other cool thing that Vodafone did was, if you were a Vodafone customer, and because there was usually super long lines to get to do this, you could text message and you would get put to the front of the line. And if you weren't a Vodafone customer, guess what? We were selling service right there. So you could become a customer very quickly if you needed to. Another thing you can do is a lot of times um, these programs you think that they need to be planned out. And planning, you know, is very important, but you can also be very spontaneous. So this was presented by Ford Fusion and Sony um, put it together and it was called Flash Concerts. And so what they did is they, um, got emails through Nokia um, was able to collect people's emails and got them to either um, email in or text in and then um, we would be in New York and um, on a Thursday all these people would start getting text messages or emails saying hey so and so group is going to be in concert for free at five o'clock tomorrow night show up. Um, so what it did is for Ford it drove people to their website which is what they wanted to do and for Sony it helped to show off some of their products and things like that. So you can be very spontaneous in what you do as well. So that's some of the delight and surprise. Now this one always amazes me. Here in the U.S. we don't really you know, care that much about the World Cup um, but everywhere else in the world does. This is one of the biggest icons there is. So Coca-Cola, being a sponsor of FIFA, um, decided to do the World Cup trophy tour. So we took the World Cup to I think about 35 cities and about 27 countries um, a couple of years ago. And this is in Mexico. And you can barely see it, but on that stage is this little trophy. And all these people showed up to get to experience it. Now this program is kind of, it's the human touch at a mass scale, and this happened everywhere. But then again, add it to another marketing platform called PR, and through this program, Coca-Cola received hundreds of millions of dollars worth of public relations through taking the um, World Cup to these people. And what does it do for Coke? People are so thankful 
that they brought it to them to be able to touch it, see it, get their picture made with it, just be part of it, experience it. There's a, a relationship built with Coca-Cola and hopefully some loyalty going forward in, in supporting their products and brands. And the one that really, you know, brought me into this world of experiential marketing or human touch was the Olympic torch relay. And when we um, first started working on it in 96, I was at Coke and my husband was um, at one of his other companies that he had started that does this type business. And up until then, the Olympic torch relay had really just been a PR tool for the OC and for whatever brand may have sponsored it, like AT&T sponsored it in 84. And it really didn't have a lot of um, energy with it. It was, you know, traveling the flame around, but not a lot of promotion and things like that. So when Coca-Cola decided to sponsor it, really for the first time in 1996, we said, how do we really make this a marketing tool? How do we really make it where it's going to help us build a stronger relationship with people for Coca-Cola? So the first thing we did is we said, we're going to give every normal person the opportunity to maybe be an Olympic torchbearer, to carry the Olympic flame. So through a promotions program um, that we did, we allowed people to nominate who they would like to be an Olympic torchbearer. So that's how the torchbearers were selected. And that was really the first time it was done that way. Before, like even in 84, you paid to get to be a torchbearer. So, so it was really the first time that the general public got a chance to participate. And that was made possible by Coca-Cola. And then, once we hit the road, we said, how are we going to make it more than just the flame running by, which is phenomenal and very cool, but how are we going to make it even more fun and refreshing? So we literally created a rolling street party. And so um, that was in 96, and we had Coca-Cola has done that rolling street party now in 1998 in Japan, in 2002 in Salt Lake City across the U.S., and then in 04, we literally did a rolling street party around the world. Um, so we took the Olympic flame around the world um, and just spread fun and refreshment for Coca-Cola. And then again in 2006 in Italy, and now we're getting ready for Beijing in 2008. So it's really nice when you see programs that can repeat themselves and continue to build that relationship with the consumers that makes it all worthwhile. And then a final example to show how the power of the human touch can work for not necessarily a product, but for a cause. The Blue Planet Run is a foundation that's all about raising awareness and funds to provide safe drinking water to the billion plus people around the world that don't have access. And it may be for different reasons and there may be different solutions. So the founder of this um, organization came up with the idea of let's literally have people run around the world to be the messengers that there's a problem and that there are solutions. So we started from the UN on June 1st and we have traveled all the way across Europe and um, just got through with Russia and we're right now in Mongolia and we will be arriving on the US, back on US soil on August 1st in, in San Francisco and we'll travel across um, through I think September 5th we end up at the UN again. And it's 20 people they're running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're running 160 miles a day. Each person runs a 10-mile leg. So it's pretty, and as far as we can tell, it's the first time that this has ever been done, that a team of people like this has literally run around the world. Dow Chemical is um, the sponsor, and their whole reason for sponsoring that is they have done a lot of great things through chemistry to help the, um, to help the, um, to help us have better products that are better stewards for our environment. And a lot of people don't know it, and they said it's time we start sharing that. And I met with the chairman of Dow, and I really believe he's sincere about making a difference through chemistry. And this is their, their coming out party. So hopefully you'll start hearing a lot about it as we get closer to August and it starts coming across the U.S. But you can use the human touch not just for products, but for getting messages across. And what I'm going to share right now is a video that I think shows converging the different um, screens to really get a message out and make a difference. I'm going to show you a clip from Live 8 that we um, participated in a couple years ago. And what it did is it took television, it was broadcast in about 200 countries um, via AOL, it was broadcast on the internet to millions of people around the world. Via Nokia, it was broadcast via cell phones. 
and um, then live the concerts around the world. And there's a segment you'll see which is pretty phenomenal, the Human Touch piece, where Will um, Smith led the world, literally, at the same time, um, conveying a message. And the good news is, a week after this, the whole premise was getting the G8 to forgive um, a, quite a bit of third world, third world debt, which would then help get a little bit closer to getting out of poverty. And a few weeks after that, the G8 did agree to forgive some of the thir third world debt. So let's see if I can make this work. tuned in is because every three seconds So there is a great example to show how all the different marketing elements with a piece of the human touch can really promote a cause or a brand. So I'd encourage you as you work through your marketing programs to consider the human touch as a piece of that marketing mix. Thank you and God bless. Have to do a Q and A, huh? <laughs> All right. Any questions? I'm sorry. I'm assuming that your company does this whole. You take an idea. They're hiring you to do those ideas, like the 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 race car. Correct. So, how long does it actually take you to do a world concept? Well, you know, um, it, it really depends. Um, ideally, you'd love to have a good year to plan something that's that large in scale. Um, and scale. But a lot of times, we've had clients come to us, and we've put things together in as little as four weeks. So it's not a worldwide scale thing. But when you're doing something from a, well, you know, actually, though, Live 8, the idea um, Bob Geldof and Harvey Goldsmith, when they actually decided they were going to do it, we were six weeks out. So we had six weeks to pull all that together. But that's not ideal. <laughs> ideal, we'd like a year. <laughs> people in these areas? And what is your staff like here in Atlanta? Um, you know, it's a lot of relationships and friends of friends. 
Um, and like I said, my husband's been doing this for about 30 years. And um, he's really, a lot of the people that are even our business, our competitors today, um, are run by people that he trained and taught. So there's a reputation out there. Um, we have probably about full time in Atlanta now, about 40 young people. And when I say young people, most of them are in their 20s. Uh, maybe early 30s. Um, this is a tough business. I mean, when young people come and say they want to be in this business, I go, are you really sure? Um, and it may not be something you want to stay in once you ha um, have children and families because there's a lot of travel. We have one gentleman who's 26 and he's now traveled around the world twice, um, once on the Olympic torch relay and um, once now on the Blue Planet Run. Um, and, you know, we just, a lot of kids right out of college, um, and um, they've, we've got a casting department, we've got a database of about 5,000 people um, just in the U.S. Um, and in our database, too, um, unfortunately, sometimes we have to put this thing called do not hire because <laughs> they didn't meet the criteria. I mean, we do a lot of evaluation, um, and it's all about energy. You know, you've got to have people that just have a great work ethic, work ethic and a lot of energy. Um, and then that has been able to spread um, around the world. What we've ended up with is a great network. Um, we just finished working on Live Earth, and we had people in all, on, all well, we didn't have people in Antarctica, but everywhere else. And um, we've just gotten a great network of, of young people that love what they do. Hey, um, I was just curious, uh, I'm 40 years old and I've been in marketing for a while now. How do you stay in touch with all the cool happening things that are going on today? I, I would imagine you get a lot from all the young people that you hire, but how do you and your husband stay ahead of the curve? Well, that's true. It's through um, the young people and we love... Um, the other day I was just walking through the office and I heard one of the guys saying, because we have a really strong intern program, um, we, um, we're located right across from Georgia Tech, so we have a lot of Georgia Tech students that intern with us, but we also have students from, we have a couple of University of Georgia students and then um, some from all over the country actually. It's become pretty competitive where the kids have to write essays and interview to be able to get into our program. But a lot of it is just being around these young people. And um, we, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we have our 9 a.m. huddle, um, where if you're not physically in Atlanta, you dial in from wherever you are in the world, and we talk about what's going on and what's new and what's happening. Um, but as I was walking through the office yesterday, I heard one of our guys saying, I need all you college kids. we got to look at what's the cool outfit for this program. And I had it all laid out, and so they got all the college kids to come in and do it. But it's really... Um, a lot of it is just um, our IT person is very strong in keeping us up with what's going on in technology and all the new tools there and, um, you know, just living in every, you know, living in, living in that world. There's no magic, you know, I wish there was, a book you could read. <laughs> Anything else? All right, great. Thank you. Susan, uh, thank you very much for your uh, comments and insight and on behalf of the Alumni Board and the Terry College of Business, I'd like to present you with this uh, lovely sculpture by a local artist, Paul Bendezunas. Paul <laughs> Great, thank you. Very, oh, it's heavy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, thank you. Then uh, also the uh, winner of our door prize this morning is Barbara Blake with Quest. And Barbara, uh, you get uh, you actually get uh, a free uh, Terry Third Thursday. Um, <laughs> and uh, so thank you, Barbara, for this coming this morning, and thank you all, and uh, especially thank you, uh, Dean, for uh, for joining us here at Terry. And we're looking forward to uh, your uh, propelling us into the future. And um, Oh, yes. Well, that, that actually goes with her award, so we're good. Uh, we got rid of the paint can, Harriet. Um, but remember, Terry Third Thursday is your key to uh, get out free uh, parking-wise, and thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next, uh, next month. Okay, thank you.